Um, I'd like to catch you up to what we are studying, and I'd like to go through uh, Galatians, kind of uh, the highlights of it, and then settle down uh, at the end on a few verses, about seven verses, try to go through it as quickly as possible uh, through it. We will end on time, or we'll just simply end. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, as you open there, or you should be there right now, Galatians is a very interesting book. It's a very um, a book that is very much um, in play in our life today. Although we may not think so, uh, thinking of Judaizers, those who are coming in and, and trying to uh, uh, bring in, uh, bring the, the, the believers back to Judaism is what they want to do. And today you'll find it in different names, like for example, tourism. Is one name that you would uh, that you can look up and see. Or oh, Hebrew roots are uh, two different classes out there that are doing basically the same thing. There may be some changes or differences in them, uh, but there's not. And really, and throughout throughout history, there are four ways of people new way of being saved or entering into salvation. The great and the top of all is this works, right? I work. And I do what I can do. I do the best I can. And that is sufficient. And then there's another uh, school of thought, and that is works and plus faith. In other words, I work and work, but there is a God, and I am faithful <laughs> that my works will outbalance, my, my good works will outbalance my bad. And so uh, in faith, then he will receive me. And then you come what's going on here in this in this uh, uh, portion with it would seem to be that is faith. You have received the Lord Jesus as your Savior. That is wonderful, but that's one thing that you lack. You need now to go back to your Hebrew roots. You need to go back to the, uh, the way of the Jews and fulfill the works or the law of Moses, specifically in circumcision. But everything else in the law itself as well. And then, of course, it's our view, which I believe, and reading Galatians through and through and just meditating upon them, you will come out with the same conclusion that is not of works at all. So it begins with works, but really is faith. Faith is what saves us. In reading Galatians, the understanding is this. It is not that works we're not to do. That is clear. As a matter of fact, at the end of the book, as we get to it, we'll see that, yes, we are mandated. There is a demand to do what is right and pleasing. But it's not the, basic of it, the basics of it is not our salvation. The question is, how is that man, woman, children <laughs> are saved? By faith in Jesus Christ alone. Alone. No other. And so chapter 1 and 2, it's a defense. You can look at it. If we will break it down, uh, it's a defense. He, he goes into two major points of defense. First of all, his apostolic right as an apostle, or one that is called of God to go out and to deliver what is what, what the message of what? Of the gospel of God's grace. And that's the second thing that he is defending. And so at the very offset, we read it, verse 1. Both points are there. Paul, an apostle. But then there's kind of like a parenthesis. He kind of takes a comma and takes a step back and says, wait a minute. What do I want to impress on these people? Is it my apostleship or is it where it came from? Our salvation is not by my works. That's not where it came from. It came by his sacrifice. This morning in the Lord's Supper, as we remembered and as we read and as we sang over and over, and my heart was this, that he took my place. He paid the price for me. And note what it says. It's not from man, he goes on, it's not by inheritance. It's not passed on because my father was and so on. So my children and your children and your children's children does not necessarily enter into the kingdom of God because of your goodness or mine. 
They enter because of his goodness, and they need to come to that decision once in, in a lifetime, hopefully soon. And that's so important that we remember that, that as we bring up our children and as we look towards our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, that we remember that they need to make a decision for Christ. And that is what's most important. Imagine eternity without them. So it's not by inheritance, nor through man. In other words, it's not appointed. It's not a labor of achievement that I can acquire. No, no, no. He says this is through Jesus Christ and God the Father. And we see these, this, that it's an appointment. As in we have, uh, he was added into, by the account of Christ himself. And we see the unity in the oneness of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He is divine. With one mind, he came to do what? That verse continues and ends with this, who raised them from the dead. Well, if the father raised the son from the dead, well, he had to die. And so in Corinthians 15, and specifically verses 1 and 4, describes to us the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, the gospel is very simple, that he was buried and he rose again according to the scripture. What scripture? The Hebrew scripture is mentioned in the old. The old is, a, is important. We need to read what is saying there that we may understand the new. Because that's the argument of Paul through Galatians. He's going to the old to say, no, you're wrong. It's only by the merit of what Christ has done upon the cross. The gospel, the gospel, brothers and sisters, is under attack. And we can show them the gospel if we take time to study the word of God and see what it says. Judaizers are very much involved today. I'm in a study with a young man that is being attacked by Judaizers, by those that will call, say that we need to go back to do the Jewish uh, law. Imagine that today, today. And Galatians has been a great help for him and for his family to get their minds straight back on the wonder of the gospel of our Lord. Look at verse 4, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age. He gave. It's a free gift. If it's a free gift. I say, well, you're preaching to the choir. Well, maybe there's some that we'll be listening later on to this uh, recorded uh, message. He gave himself as a free gift. We must always remember this because this is what's going to draw us to do what he has demanded us when we see his goodness and his greatness. It will give us a lift in understanding and a, and a fortitude to go forward in him that we may be delivered from where? From this present evil age. Not just from religion, keep in mind but also from, 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 from the moral decay and the political dec decay that, that is corrupting us. You know, if we think that a politician in this country can save us, we are wrong. I don't care if it's the right or the left. I don't care if it's in the middle. There's no such thing. It's Christ and Christ alone. The kingdom of God is at hand. That's my government. That's my Savior. It's my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Scripture tells us things that are just simply going to get worse and worse. Look at it today. Under the left or the right, it doesn't matter. There's homosexuality. Right now, it's perfectly fine, no matter what party you're in, to be a homosexual, to marry and to have a life. What does the Word of God say? And it's hard. It's hard. I know it. But we need to stand at what the Word of God says and show love and compassion to these who are confused, mistaken. The lust of the flesh is terrible. 
and we need to stand fast in his word. Abortion, it's another. At whatever cost, at whatever stage, I'm too young. My life is still before me to have a child. Then don't have sex. It's only one way you can get pregnant. It's only one way. I'm sorry. I, I mean, I guess you can go get implanted. But really, it's one way. But we desire the pleasures of this life, of this world, for a moment that is fleeting versus eternity in Christ our Lord. And so he defends the gospel. And so as a good lawyer in a courtroom, he takes exhibit A in Acts 15. He's going to go to Jerusalem, and he brings in historical accounts, something that had taken place. And he says, Galatians, listen to me in verse 1 of chapter 2. After 15 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and also I took exhibit A, Titus, a, gen a Greek, a Gentile, who's a believer. And he goes over there because in chapter 15 and verse 1, and I thought this to be interesting uh, when I looked at it, because notice, it, notice what it says, if I can just simply get to it. Verse 15 and verse 1, and here's the account that he is referring to. And certain men came down from Judea, taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised, here it is, circumcision. This is the key note. And they're saying you need to go back to be circumcised and then fulfill the law of Moses. But it begins with circumcision. But here's what I find interesting. Note what they say, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Brothers and sisters, those of you listening and friends, it's not about our religious, religion activity. That it's of our Lord. Paul is going to go back to Abraham. He said, no, let's go back to the roots of where it began. Let's go back to Abraham. And what does it say about him? But before he goes into theology, and before he goes into doctrine, he has given them an experience of what took place. And he's setting up, and as a good lawyer, he brings up this, this exhibit A. But then he says this after the meeting that they have had in verse 33 of chapter I'm sorry, no wonder it didn't look right. Chapter 2, back in Galatians. And down into verse 3, it says, Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Those disciples, Peter, James, John, who are, seem to be pillars, as the Paul would say, would not say that he needed to be circumcised. In other words, they agreed with Paul. Mind you, that Paul did not go and get any kind of formal training from the apostle. It was all gathered from the Hebrew scripture and his time alone with the Lord. It was impressed upon him as he saw the evidences there that it's not about the law, but it's about the grace of God that we're saved. This is a wonderful section because I think in, section, in, in chapter 1 and 2, that defense of the gospel, we find it here in verse, five, in verse 4. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in to do what? By stealth to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that we might bring, uh, that he might not bring, my, uh, I'm sorry, Wow, I mumbled there for a little bit, didn't I? <laughs> that they might bring us into bondage. In my studies, I came across this, this chart by David Pawson, uh, an English preacher uh, and author, uh, that uh, he re really brought out the, the by just by this simple uh, uh, poster and outline of the, of the Galatians, and it was this, if you would picture, right, a mountain, 
And upon this mountain, and the top of this mountain is our Lord and Savior. And there's our focus. There's what we need to look at. There we find liberty. There we find freedom. But if we slope down to the side of the mountain and we enter into the valley, in the valley of legalism, which is fighting here, going back to the law, we find imprisonment. And the wrath of God falls upon, upon those who are holding the law. So as he, if you keep that, that, that thought in mind, when you come to chapter 3 and 4, it is indeed his, it is this call concerning uh, the, the, the doctrinal, the explanation of the gospel, of the grace of God. And he's going to do it in two ways. Historical, and then in that history, he's going to look at the, at, at the, it's an allegorical viewpoint. That is, to bring out the hidden message, to extract from the historical account what God is saying that gives us the principle of his action and his thoughts towards us. And chapter 3 is going to begin with experience. Think of your experience when you came to know the Lord. How good were you? I remember my experience when I came to know the Lord. If you will close your eyes real tight, right, and you put your hands over your eyes, and then you put your, your, your face into a pillow, what you have is total darkness. When I came to know the Lord, that's where I was in a state of mind, physically as well, in complete darkness. And as a matter of fact, when the Lord approached me, that's exactly, with my eyes full open, I was in complete darkness. And the voice of God said, you sinned against me. We all have come to our Lord and Savior because we've come to the realization that I cannot meet His requirements. That we have all sinned. And so we come, and the word says, in order for us to be saved, is we need to repent, not do better. I've come, the Lord said, for those who are sick, even for the unrighteous, not for the righteous, that they may be saved, that they may be healed. And so experience, look at verse 2. What a, what, I'm sorry, verse 3, what a wonderful question. There's five questions here. We just look at this one. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? <laughs> Simple. Look at your experience, and now you're going to go back to do the works? You know, the law as brings imprisonment. We see it from verse 10 down to verse 14 of chapter 3. I think it's very pointed. What does the law bring? What brings a curse? Two things. Curse is everyone who hangs upon the tree in verse 10. And the first one is this, that already God has passed a curse to all who have sinned. For the soul that sinneth shall surely die. The curse is there. But what can the law do? Absolutely nothing. Look at verse 11. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. The two problems with the law is this. It only tells you you're a sinner. It doesn't tell you that it has no power to save you. We know this, but thank be to the Lord. Right? There are four promises here or four uh, uh, solutions, which is really one, which is the gospel, and is this, that Christ has redeemed us, verse 13. That is, he has uh, uh, paid the price, and the word here means to pay the price of a stronghold that was against you and against me. He paid that price to deliver us. Secondly, having become a curse for us. He took our place. That was this morning. He took our place. That's what we deserved. All right? Thirdly, uh, it says down in verse 14 that that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. What is the blessing of Abraham? Well, in the experience, he says in verse 6, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. 
What is the blessing? The blessing that we can be then righteous, just. In other words, our wrongs have been acquitted. We are free. Freedom. Liberty. Christ the center. And lastly, which is 3 through 4 through chapter 4, it's about the promise, the promise, the promise. Note what it says. The Gentiles in Christ Jesus, in the latter part of that verse, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And I want you to understand, it's not just simply going back to Genesis and Abraham. The Spirit is promised to us in Joel. It, it goes back to Deuteronomy, to Malachi. It goes into Revelation. He goes to, well, Revelation really is the New Testament. But Malachi, De- De- Deuteronomy, you can look at Numbers, you can look at, at Joel, Jeremiah. He's going back, Isaiah. He's going back into all these and bringing out the fact of the promise of God towards us in Christ Jesus. It's not just simply that we are saved and we have been separated and now we, have, we enjoy the liberty of being with Christ. It's not just about that, but it's about an inheritance. Look how it ends chapter 3 and picks up in chapter 4. Look at 5. To redeem those who were under the law that we may receive the adoptions of sons. Not as a child that has no rights, but as a son with full rights in the very kingdom of God. That's the emphasis of this passage. Mature with all the benefits, complete liberty. No longer do we have a tutor that smacks us when we do wrong. That's the law. But now we, have, we are fully adopted as children of God that we can call him Abba. My daddy. Isn't that wonderful? Who doesn't want that? Raise your hand. Oh, nobody. Nobody rose their hand. Thank God. That is correct. Now, as we move through chapter 4 and where we're at this coming Wednesday, I invite you all to come out, please. Come on out. Listen to the Word of God. But more importantly, to spend a time together in prayer, one with another. This is a very central function of Scripture. As a matter of fact, in Galatians, there are four things that, that a church does together. And one of that is to pray together, to come together, spend time together in prayer before the wonder of our Lord and Savior. If you're able to make it, and I hope you are, come on out. And we're going to cover 21 through 31. And we're going to look at the historical account, verses 21 to 23. We're going to look at the allegorical, as he pulls out the, the principles of it from 24 down to 27, and then the practical application from verses 28 to 31. Come on out and listen to this. And he's going to bring out these things. Two covenants. Two covenants. Hagar and Sarah. And under Hagar, we find Ishmael, which is Mount Sinai, it is the flesh. What was conceived by the flesh, the works, slavery, that's what it ends up, which equals bondage. We just read it in chapter 2. But then we'll look at Sarah. And in Sarah we find Isaac, which is the promise of God. We see faith, we see freedom equals liberty. 5 and 6, however, it's the other side of the mountain. And there's another valley in the mountain. So over here we have prison. We have uh, uh, legalism. We have bondage. But in this side, in the other side, we have what we would uh, uh, call a license that we do not have. We have liberty, brothers and sisters. We do not have a license to do whatever we want. As a matter of fact, we don't have a license to follow the desire of my own flesh, which he is going to discuss in chapter 5 and down in verse 16 onward. We need to look at our flesh and our desires and see if it squares with the Spirit of God, with the Word of God. And if it doesn't, we need to yield in obedience to produce the fruit of the Spirit of God. Yes, there is a demand, right? There is, uh, and uh, without being, you know, uh, scared about it, the Word of God demands us to work. 
We are created in his work, by his workmanship into Christ Jesus to do good work. I think I butchered that. Sometimes I just gotta, just gotta go through the whole thing. By grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. There is. But it has nothing to do with our salvation. But everything to do with our witness. So with that in mind, as with this last 15 minutes that we have pending, I wanted to go back in Galatians chapter 1. Now, if, you're, uh, if, you, if you took notes, these are just helpful hints on how to study the word as you go into these sections. Uh, you can keep in mind some of these things to keep us focused as we do our study uh, into it. It's always good to do that. But as we look at uh, back in chapter 1, I want to look. I hear this, the call of apostleship for Brother Paul. But I want to look at this as a call to our lives. This is not just simply for the apostle. We can also draw from it some applications to our own selves, our own lives. Note what he says in verse 11. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel, the subject of Galatians, which was preached to me, is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. And so there are three points as we look at this, and it's something that is extremely important. It's fine, it's perfectly fine to sit under a teacher of the word of God and to learn from him. I I listen a lot to, uh, to uh, uh, um, a lot of these books, either on, uh, on tape or I, I read and I, and, I, and I take out commentaries and I read through them. It's perfectly fine to do that. <clears throat> we always got to have an ear to the Lord and to his word. We always got to be comparing it. We don't stay steadfast to men. Man will always lead us astray, even myself. Don't listen to everything I say if it doesn't correlate with the word of God. If I say something that is incorrect, may the Lord erase it from your mind and from your heart. It's not of man in, these ver- in, the, in the verses here, 11 and 12a, that we read about. Note what it says. Not, it, it, the brethren, that the gospel which it was preached to me is not according to man or not in, uh, invented by man, you can say. Note also, which was preached to me is not according to man, for, verse 12, I neither received it from man, not, it is not an appointment from man to another. God has an, man hasn't appointed this to be preached in a certain time, certain places. It's the word of God. But then lastly, it says this, um, it, uh, from man nor was I taught it. In other words, not of wisdom in man. And this is coming from one that sat at the feet of Gamaliel. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly or not, but that's okay. I'm sure they can't pronounce Jimenez either. Accent on the first E, by the way. Jimenez. Never mind. Um, and he sat on the feet of the greatest teacher of the time. One that Philippians would say, he's saying about himself how wonderful he was as a Jew. He was from the stock of Benjamin. He was a Jew from a Jew, Jew that his father and mother did all that was right, even circumcised on the eighth day, not the ninth. And yet, he says, it's not about the wisdom. It's not the invention, it's not the appointment, nor is it a wisdom of men. But 12b, he makes it clear, it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ, through his revelation. You know, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 comes to mind. You can make a note and go back to that. It is God putting in us. When I came to know the Lord, it was not because someone pestered me about the gospel, although that's not wrong. But probably because the Lord knew I was too thick headed and too stupid to listen. So He met me where I needed to be met. And I think that's true of all of us. The Lord meets you exactly where you need to be met. The problem is that we suppress the calling of God in our hearts. And I say don't. If you're here and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're listening and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you feel this tug, this desire, this this something you need to quench in your heart and your soul, 
call to him. He hears. He will answer. And he will guide you where you need to be. And so we see that he says it. It was through the revelation. We remember him in the, going on the road to Damascus. Right there, the, the light that shone blinded him. Interesting. Light, blind. Because that's what he was with all his knowledge in the Jewish faith. Look at 13 through 14. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the tradition of my fathers. So there we have it. His testimony before faith. What is your testimony before coming to know the Lord if you're here and you know him? Wasn't it so much so far apart from him? Now, some of you thank the Lord you were very young and you don't remember maybe much about your latter years. Let me tell you, it's a blessing. You saved yourself a lot of heartaches, a lot of pain, a lot of regrets. So we want our children to come to know him young because you want to save them from such pain. But for us that have been there and we remember, what a joy, what a difference that it makes. And not just when it happens, but the years after, and you see the hand of God in your life. Rejoice. It's good to remember those days in the back so that you can appreciate what you have today, that you can appreciate our Lord. Know what he did. He was a persecutor and a destructor of the, of the church of God. He had pride in his religion. Again, not because you're religious means that you are the Lord's. You need to have an encounter. You need to ask the Lord. And remember, it's the Lord's call. It's the Lord's call. All we are are instruments. We just give the word and leave the results in his hand. And that's where we want them. If not, it would destroy you and it would destroy me. Look at the, verse 15. But when it pleased God, and here it is. It's his call. It's his uh, uh, work. We're just simply giving the information. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. You know, the wonder of Paul and how he puts things. As I was meditating upon this, ver this verse, it w it <clears throat> even, you know, the Lord saved me. Right? And he did. He saved you. But know how he puts it. When he, before the, he was even born, the call of God was towards him. You know that the Lord has called, has made the provision before you were even born to save you. God says he desires that all men may be saved. The problem is that not all men wants to. But if the, if the Lord doesn't call you, if the Lord doesn't lead you, there is no way that you can be saved or that I can be saved. We try, but what, what is it? Is it my faith or is it his grace or his call? Which one is it? Yes, it is. And we say it doesn't make sense. Are you making sense of God? So if you want to reconcile it in your mind in some way, maybe this. God, before in eternity past, made the plan when he made you and me to save us through Christ. The call is there. Would you answer that call? How about that? Would you answer that call? But note how he places it. He said, the separation of him from his mother's womb and called me through grace. What I don't deserve is this point here. I did not deserve this call. Neither do you, and neither do I. And yet, the call is there 
for you to receive him as your savior. The call is there. And so as we remember our time of from the past, from being in sin, to come into faith in Christ and how he saved me, it should propel us. This is the reason why we gathered uh, on Sunday mornings to remember his death. This is should be, propel us to do, do what he demands us to do, to lean on the Spirit and allow the Spirit to work through us and in us. Well, first in us and then through us. Because look at verse 17. I'm sorry, 16. To reveal his Son in me. So this grace, what does it do? It reveals the Son in me. And you're going to notice, and maybe you get a lighter, a highlighter, as you go through Galatians and underline all the in in Scripture, in Galatians. In Christ, Christ in me. It's all over. What is he saying? You know, probably the, the keynote or the, the, the verse of Galatians is found in 2.20. Chapter 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In Christ lives in me. Concerning the crucifixion, Christ now lives in you, in me, who received him as Savior. This means security. We're secured in Christ. We cannot lose our salvation. Why? Because Christ died for me and is in me. But then it says, in the life which I now live, in the the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. So now Paul is saying, now I live, my walk in this world is in Christ. Later on, he's going to say in verse 27 of chapter 3, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And here's the problem, that we love our old clothes, right? Right? My gator shirt, my Azad jacket, right? My members only, I should say. Wow, really dating me, huh? My members only jacket. I love those, right? The old me. And so what I do is I put an overcoat of Christ over my clothes. Colossians tells us to fully be undressed and fully be dressed with Christ. Are you? Am I? We fall short, brothers and sisters. We know it. We know it. And yet he is in me. And he is in you. If you don't have him as your savior, then he is not in you. And you can never put him on properly. You may try. And the Lord even may use some of you religious people. Oh, but the peace is not there. Make sure that we are in Christ. See, he is in me that I might then are able to preach him, verse 16 of chapter 1, among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, he's going to say. But know what he's doing now. His witness is here. His, his witness cannot be until Christ is fully in him. That he may then share those in need. What a wonderful Savior. What about us? What about us? What about me? You know, <clears throat> his preparation was also very awesome as we close off at exactly 12 o'clock. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. He doesn't go to see Peter until verse 18, three years later. Now, this may not be so for all of us. We all need instructors, right? There's some given by God to be teachers for the edification, for the building, and that is good. Paul was just another cat. He was one that was already prepared. What he needed was direction. And so he goes aside, and this is what I want to bring out here. If my gospel doesn't line up with your gospel, we need to sit down and find out what the, really the word of God said. Because what happens when he goes to Peter, and he's going to say it again in chapter 2 and verse 9, <clears throat> when he goes again and <clears throat> back in, in chapter 15 of Acts, which we already discussed, 
what takes place. He goes with this, is the law, do we need to do the law? And in verse 9 of chapter 2 says, And James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, received the grace that, that had been given to me. They gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they should go to the circumcised. You see, though Paul was independent from the apostles, they were united in the gospel. We need to be united in the gospel because there's only one gospel. There's only one gospel. And that is the Lord Jesus has paid it all. And through his sacrifice, we are saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask, Lord, that you bring conviction to our hearts. Not by my words, but by the reading of your words. Father, we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In whom and through whom. We have life and that eternal and an inheritance that awaits us as Peter informs us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.